Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Fung. And today I'm here with Peter Gregson. And Peter's a composer. He does music for films. He does his own music, of course. He's got, um, we have an album to talk about, the Patina, that has some pretty cool stuff with uh, an attention to like organic, natural sounds, something I'm, I'm really into myself of how to make things sound like they've lived a life a little bit. And I've enjoyed that about his work. Um, really some great music and um, a lot of insights to share about creating it. And I'm very happy to connect with them. Peter, welcome to the show. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to see you, sir. Um, doing well here towards the end of the summer? Yeah, we've had a wild heat wave here in London. And yes, uh, no. we have no, no air conditioning. So oh, boy. looking forward to it finishing. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I mean, that was making news here in New York. Yeah, yeah. I heard. I heard. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, you know, nothing quite like the weather to make uh, a Brit complain. It doesn't matter if it's hot, cold, wet, dry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in we'll, London, we'll uh, you know, London and other parts in the in the area uh, around this time of year and end of August, uh, mm. a few years back for my honeymoon, and it was considerably cooler, you know. So yeah. to have you guys go like well above what we're used to was yeah, yeah big deal. Yeah, it's been wild, mm. been wild. So, yeah, well, nothing <laughs> like you said. Now. Mother Nature will. Uh, make us all feel small pretty quick <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i've uh you know my first introduction to like what you're doing was through the video um which was sort of like a mini documentary for patina uh, or the mm. electronic press kit you know and kind of like oh, interview yeah. style yeah. and um you know of course like i really enjoyed the music um where you've got a lot of orchestral elements, but also um, you, you have like your own unique take on that kind of style. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really uh, interested in some of the stuff you said about giving the music like a life, like it's lived. Like you compared it to like if your favorite album inevitably wears down over time because you just play it too much. Maybe yeah. not on streaming, but if you have a record or even a cassette tape, you know, you know that that worn well, out sound <laughs> yeah i mean that's it it's like you know in in your everyday life you know i'm wearing a pair of jeans that i've worn hundreds of times thousands of times i don't know i've had them for a couple of years um and i wear them they're the most comfortable jeans i own but consequently they're probably the least smart you know the, the kind of identity of them and the the kind of impact of my life on those genes has has de decayed them it's degraded them and, and they're no longer the best they've ever been like you know perfect day for a pair of jeans is the day you buy them in the shop but the perfect day to wear a pair of jeans is probably the day before you have to throw them out because you know <laughs> um or like you say you know a, a record that you play your, your favorite record it played a thousand times and it it wears its head it gets pops and crackles and and it sort of always it doesn't, you know, the photograph on the wall that the light hits and it kind of fades or the painting that fades. And you think, well, well, how does that work in a digital age where we create something that, you know, you can stream it once or a billion times and there's no impact on that. There's no impact on the, your kind of relationship with it. It doesn't change. It doesn't, it's perfect forever. And how are we supposed to relate to that? Uh, you mm -hmm. know, it's a, it's like the least human thing. We all age, we all decay, we all change, you know, we're, we're, we're fluid in that respect. And, you know, how are we supposed to relate to completely perfect snapshot in time, completely immovable art? And it's always sort of always sat quite uncomfortably with me. Like, how do you... Yeah, how do you relate to that? How do we expect people to relate to that? And um, I thought, well, you know, when we perform music, obviously it changes. It, it you know, it has a, a life on stage, mm. um, and you can record a performance, but you can't have an organic performance ever changing ever. And I thought, well, I can't do anything about that. But maybe we could, when we're when I'm producing this record, when we're recording it, 
maybe we can try and you know use elements you have kind of dusty sounds have, have things that sound like they've lived so the synthesizers for example rather than just being di'd straight into you know the mixing desk or the sound card or, or whatever um we recorded i recorded them played them in and then we reamped them inside a big big studio took that that went onto tape it came back out it did all you know it went through as many processes to become acoustic and become organic and real and tactile and you know the engineer i work with at the beginning when we started doing this he's like you know it's that this is like a two percent at best three percent improvement a three five percent if we're being generous kind of thing but, you know if you add them up you do that for every element of you you know you, you find that one kind of noisy eq pop on an ssl desk and you, can, you know you crank it just the right way. you find all these little bits of personality you find all these little bits of sort of dust on the lens and they all add up and it becomes a very different output it becomes very textured very quickly and it becomes um yeah it sounds like it's lived a life mm. you know it doesn't have to be ever changing but what i i love the idea that it doesn't sound clean you know it doesn't sound kind of pristine um but it's also not like tape hiss noise you know it's it's yeah. little kind of flex you know like little flex of paint little kind of yeah flex of dust on the on a camera lens um and that stuff's always really excited me like when we when you record a cello um this or any kind of classical string instrument the sound of a cello if you think of it right now it's most likely the sound of a cello in a concert hall you know it's a kind of a classical sounding warm washed out sound and that's sort of accurately how a cello is recorded in the classical world um but it's not really how the cello sounds when you play it you know when you play it it's all like <laughs> fingers on the strings it's scratchy and scrapey and clattering and it's very detailed the kind of the cacophony is is really interesting and kind of um the sound actually under your ear is i'm not saying it's not beautiful but it's very um yeah it's very noisy and that gets washed out when you're halfway back in a concert hall um but i've often thought you know what if that's like your accent you know when you speak you've got the way you form vowels and consonants plosives sibilants all these things add up to you having a recognizable voice if you turn the radio on and if it's paul mccartney singing you'll recognize that it's Paul McCartney singing and you'll you'll hear it and you think that's oh, Paul McCartney singing whatever the song is not oh that's the song being sung by Paul McCartney whereas with classical music i feel like you recognize the piece and then you might recognize the performer because you might remember the recording but there's so much identity in my humble opinion so much identity of the performer washed out in the recording process and i really wanted to bring the whole kind of recording experience much closer to try and capture or try and kind of convey that identity in sound production you know we we learn i i started playing the cello when i was 4 so I've been playing the cello for 31 years like it's a fundamental part of my life you know my kind of personality my being and you know we spent all this time learning how to create a sound how to shape a sound how to project it how to you know tell stories through it that kind of thing you know, wow why would you why would you kind of soften that by anonymizing it or not trying to get it as accurate a sound as possible so 
Um, it's something I, I I really care about and I love. I love the process. And um, yeah, I feel like you know the the sort of sonics of Patina for now are the closest I've got to the sound that's in my head when I think of my cello sound. It's like the truest representation of what that sounds like for me. Mm. I think that's a great point because strings, especially from a distance and then, you know, layered with other strings really <coughs> kind of smooth each other out and the, you lose the friction that it takes to create those sounds. And <coughs> I know I, I have a cello myself and I don't play it very well, but I was really surprised at just like how awful it sounds when you don't know what you're doing and you're trying to do the bow and, and mm -hmm. because it's just all the screeching and, you know, you're not that going in the changes. right angle, and, but it's, it is a kind of fundamental part of the instrument that does get kind yeah. of, you know, it happens with like, if you record your vocals even, and you layer two or three on top of that, you start to lose the like, kind of like consonant sounds or the, the scratchiness in the voice gets smoothed over. A lot yeah. of times I'll do that sort of production for that reason, because I'm, I'm trying to, you know, fill in the gaps basically. Yeah. But when you take them away, you can just really get inside like the throat of the person and really it's an Absolutely. intimate sound. Yeah. Um, I think, I think also it's, you know, you, you said it just there, it's the friction, it's that kind of, it's something you can play against and, you know, in the uh, the kind of Billie Eilish style of really like smoky, intense, like mm. like you're under a blanket, you know, hearing Almost this voice. ASMR, like yeah, uh, yeah, you know. But then, um, you know, I think the uh, the one that really blew me away, actually, in that kind of respect, was the uh, the latest Adele record where she's got the intimacy, the closeness, but then just let's rip. And you think, wow, it's like, you know, because that was one thing that we really came up against with, with Patino, that record is that a lot of the melodies are very intimate. They're very soft and they're, you know, they're, they're played quietly. Um, but there are moments where the dynamics expand you know, playing a loud melody in a small room with a highly dynamic instrument will sound very squashed very quickly. So it ends up actually having to go to um, quite a big room to record so that we could get the the dynamic range. We made a little cave inside it for the cello mm. to really deaden it, but then so that we could like zoom out into this bigger kind of you dynamic made, you range. Made a cave? Well, yeah, like with gobos, and you know, kind of blocked off the sides just to gotcha, kind of okay. stop it becoming swampy early. Mm. Um, you know, like my my big pet peeve, in, and it, it happens all the time. And I understand, you know, especially in pop music, where if we, you know, if there's a string arrangement, so often you go in and, and you're asked to play, or you know, I've written string arrangements where you, you write them, and they say, yeah, you know, we need a big string line here, we need a big string line there. And then what happens is they just get turned, the whole big full-throated performance gets turned down like minus 20 dB. And you're like, but we could have played it quietly. My pet peeve is having something loud made quiet. Mm. It's like, if you want it quiet, in my humble opinion, you should play it quietly. <laughs> something loud turned down is not something quiet. You know, it, it embody it tells the wrong story for me. Um, and it's like, if I listen to a track and a sort of a dynamically loud line played back at a low level, I just, it just drives me up the wall. I'm like, the, it feels like a, kind of a misfire in communication somehow you know it's no longer all the parts the parts of the p 
peaks are no longer all telling the same story. You know, like they tacked on the strings at the end or they tacked on the BVs or they tacked on the choir or, or whatever it might be. And, um, you know, on, uh, on Patina, I wanted to make sure that anything that was playing was at a kind of authentic, like, it, it, they weren't all done at the same time. You know, the, the strings were layered separately to the as separately to the piano separately to the cello um but i wanted to make sure that everything was performed the right dynamic kind of mm. temperature you know so if there's something that's loud or something like that is to draw your attention it was played loud relative you know relative to the other elements that are happening um and i think especially with the string instruments they are so amazing at, you know, you can play something loud and have a very thin, focused sound. You can play something soft with the broadest kind of flabby sound that really fills the space, but isn't heavy loud, you know? Mm. And um, yeah, I love all that kind of, the shades of quiet stuff, you know, you can work your way through from basically silent up to pretty quiet, but you know, the, the kind of different ways of playing it, ways of pulling the sound out of the instrument really can um, can be a very powerful tool, especially when it's layered up with synthesizers or, or reverbs or delays or whatever. You can really create some kind of pretty, pretty intense uh, soundscapes. Mm-hmm. It's a great consideration too when you're putting something together, especially when it's not, say, like a live band where, you know, it just this is how it sounds, and that you kind of naturally balance things so that you can stand in a room and enjoy it the way it's meant to be heard. Yeah. But when you take something super loud like that and turn it down, it gets so unnaturally small that. Yeah, it, can, it really can like on a guitar or or like a drum kit. Like when you make it too quiet, it's like it doesn't make sense to the ear. It, exactly, and then the intention of the performance is wrong. Hmm. You know, right. and I think, uh, like you say, I mean, the dream ticket is, in some respects, the dream ticket is to have it all performed once at the same time. But then, you know, myself and Adam, the engineer I work with, we we're trying to balance that with also retaining a lot of control for um sort of atmos mixing and various other things that need to be done this was also actually we recorded it in between what turned out to be two lockdowns so actually we weren't able to get enough people we wouldn't be able to do it <laughs> just because the number of people involved um the, the 12 person string ensemble was chosen because that's what we were able to fit in a room the size of, mm-hmm. that we wanted the space we wanted to record in um so yeah i think i think you're right you know it's, it, it it just it has that kind of disconnect it just doesn't quite it's not that it's wrong it just doesn't feel quite true or doesn't feel quite believable mm. and i think that's the sort of especially in this kind of music where you know, there are no lyrics. There's no, uh, <laughs> there are no lyrics. There's no kind of explicit narrative. You know, you've got to be really clear with the intention of your ingredients. You know, all the elements have to tell the same story. They've all got to add up to one coherent thing. Because it, it's just, um, um, you know, I can see your your synth collection behind you, but like if you take a great big fat kind of mode thing <laughs> and turn it down, it, it loses its yeah. everything. You know, it's it's a sound that is designed to hit you. It is not a sound that is designed to bed in neatly underneath everything else. <laughs> you know, otherwise you change the sound. You use yeah. a different instrument. You know. Um, yeah, so it's it's something I, I get. I spent a lot of time thinking about. I spend a lot. I spend a lot of time 
listening for. And I, I just, um, you know, with, with these records of my own music, I feel like it's a real privilege to be able to take that time to really kind of work through, like therapy, you know, like work through those issues, you know? yeah. <laughs> like work through the, uh, like, well, how, you know, okay, it's one thing to get frustrated with, with, with how things are done, but like, how would you do it better? How would you, you know, okay, I don't, I didn't like the sound on this recording I played on. So, so what didn't you like about it? How could you do it better? How could you tweak it? How can you kind of, so yeah, I, I love the kind of getting closer and closer to the kind of the truth of the, the sound and the truth of the, uh, the instrument, especially, you know, it's such an important part in this musical space, kind of contemporary classical space, like the sonics are, are so important and it takes such a, you know, how, how sound is kind of recorded and produced is just, just a kind of hallmark of this subset of genre, I guess, mm. um, which is great. I love it. <laughs> yeah i like i like that's a great just point um because turning something loud down quietly like in the real world if you were going to hear that that would mean you'd lose some of the higher frequencies because you're further away from it and maybe a little natural reverb would come in but if you turn up the quiet sound it just brings it close and then you mm -hmm. get that intimacy so it sounds like the whispering in your ear where you could actually hear that if the loud stuff is there, but yeah, further away. This is exactly it. You know, if someone whispers in your ear, it's really loud. It's like, yeah. But if they shout at you from 50 meters away, it's also loud, you know, and it's like, what's that crossover point between, you know, the intensity of, I've always loved this idea, you know, the, the kind of the engaging public speaker you know you take like anyone can shout but someone who's really got your attention they whisper and everyone listens i love this idea that mm. um just making things louder and louder and louder does not get people listening mm. but just one quiet the right thing at the right volume is just it's so powerful and um yeah just I really, I got, I got really consumed with this idea. Like, could you, could you turn on the radio and recognise the sound? Because when I listened to, you know, my childhood, I spent listening to hundreds of different recordings of the same pieces of music, and there are elements which you would recognise for sure. You know, there are elements of, like, I, you could probably identify. I, I could probably identify a couple of cellists performing the Bach cello suites, for example. Would but that I be like, like a solo piece then? Yeah, yeah, so the Bach cello suites for just the cello is yeah. incredibly exposed. And there's a, there was a Russian cellist called um, Mstislav Rostropovich who played very long, big sound, very full-bodied. Um, which is quite unusual for how people play Bach. It's normally quite kind of refined and elegant. Um, but what I don't know is whether I would recognize him playing any other piece, like whether I would recognize, whether I can kind of codify like the hallmarks of his accent and his voice. Mm. And it's always, it's always sort of, I know it's not the same thing, a singer singing with their own personal voice and their own personal accent, I understand that it is a different thing. But for the sake of the analogy, we always talk about the, the cello singing or cello speaking and the voice of the instrument and how you, you know, communicate. I hope, well, it's something I want to pursue. I want to get, so I, like even down to microphone choices, preamp choices, mine is my whole kind of signal chain is basically chosen around not thinking but kind of ignoring the fact that it's actually a cello like there are certain microphones you would reach for for a cello um but I'm like, well no let's just assume that 
this is a, a human voice, what would the microphone be for this frequency range? Mm -hmm. If it was a human voice, if it, you had a singer singing, what microphone would you go for for this sound? And um, yeah, likewise with the preamps and kind of going away from the, the cleanest to the clean kind of classical world and trying to just get a bit more texture. And yeah, it's been a great, it's been great fun. Mm. <laughs> and I, I, I'm still kind of experimenting with it and, and trying to, as I say, get closer and closer to this, this kind of sound world that I think, um, but then you never really get that, do you? That's the whole joy of it. Yeah, right. You know, you get close and you think, oh, no, it's too much mid range. Maybe I EQ it and then you ruin the whole thing and then you've got to start again. <laughs> it's, it's a fun take on it, though, because you can really present music that we've known for hundreds of years, really, on instruments we've known for hundreds of years in such a different light. You know, to hear like the aggression of the cello and hear the you know, the kind of like push and pull of that bow against the strings. There's a violence to it almost that yeah. you can emphasize depending on where that mic goes, what the room is and how far away we are from it. And that yeah. applies to really um, lots of instruments. I mean, even if I'm thinking playing guitar, say I'm finger picking real quietly, like almost like yeah. I'm not trying to wake someone up and you kind of crank that up a little bit. Yeah, that, you get all, all that lovely thing and all, all the kind of fret burn, fret buzz. And all you that hear stuff. the people, you hear the person in there, you hear the yeah, life. Definitely. And that's, I feel like that's the thing that, you know, especially in this day and age where everything's kind of ironed out, yeah. you know, every, every performance is in time, every performance is in tune. And that's not to say that, that you know, they should be negligently out of tune or negligently out of time but you know playing kind of tempo and pitch are expressive tools as well you know it's obviously there are certain styles of music where it's mechanically advantageous or it's preferred that it is absolutely bang on the grid or it's whatever but this kind of soft left-leaning contemporary classical music is not one of them you know and to iron everything out into a kind of metronomic thing or, you know, to tune every performance to within an inch of his life. It's like, actually, that's one of the joys of, of string playing. You can, you know, you can play kind of between the notes. You can, you can intone a lot of, you know, you can, you can carry a lot of intention um, by having a kind of lower third in the chord or a, or a brighter third in the chord can kind of, you know, you can say the thing. Um, I sort of worry sometimes that people have lost the ability to hear that. Mm. Or you have lost the, I don't mean imagination, but have lost the kind of tolerance for mm. imperfection. You know, you know, think of like Instagram. Like everything is perfect. Everything is beautifully framed. No one really wants to know that behind the little square is like bedlam Don't you know that the world is on fire and <laughs> yeah. it's all kind of muck because that little square and the perfect plate of food or the you know the beautiful beach no one cares no one wants to care about the rest of it and you kind of mm. and then you go and see the real thing and you're like oh it's not quite as blue it's not quite as yellow it's not quite as and it's like, yeah, well, there's a filter on it. It's being edited. Mm. It's not real. It's not, yeah. you know. On well, like people's kind of features as well. Of, you know, you yeah. can smooth out your wrinkles and your... Yeah, well, like, I logged on to Zoom on. today for this and there's a, a little button you can press yeah. to fix my complexion. You're like, what's that? Right. You know, <laughs> it's mad. Mm. Um, yeah, and I think, I think that's kind of thing you know obviously as an effect or as a as a kind of instrument it's a really you know it can be a really creative thing it can be a really interesting sound it can be a really interesting thing it's, it's interesting to play with that but i think it's important that it's not you know not just ironing out the personality or ironing out the reality of it. Mm. 
Mm. Um, because there's so much that's lost there. So much kind of humanity, free range, yeah. free range, organic humanity yeah. that's, <laughs> that's ironed out, and that's it's difficult to put back in. It's difficult to put the genie yeah. back in the. You know, it's. I feel like it's very easy to listen to something that is kind of completely kind of flat and perfect. It's just very easy to listen to it. It's like, it's functionally pretty easy and in some ways quite satisfying to eat like heavily processed foods. You don't feel great the next day, <laughs> but it, you know, it's quite easy to eat a Big Mac or whatever. Right. <laughs> um, you know, goes down quite easily, it's like sugary, it just does its thing. Mm. Um, but it doesn't really sustain you. It doesn't really kind of, mm. you know, it doesn't really kind of do much for you by way of nutritional content. No, other than really, not in a good in, way, anyway. <laughs> yeah, but there was a video doing the rounds the other day of, gosh, which the Michael Jackson song, but it's it just the vocals, BVs, harmonies, everything. And it's absolutely incredible, like soloed out just the vocals. Mm. Oh, man, it's just like it's a lie. You know, it's it's like you're right there. It's completely visceral. And it's you know, he's doing this kind of self chorusing thing. It's not perfect. It's not in time, in places. He's that bit out. But my word, if you changed a millimeter of it, the whole thing would fall. You know, and there's such like life in that. And I just think it's I think it's a really slippery slope to to go down this kind of hyper constructed the irony being of course that the album we're talking about was hyper constructed in the kind of, you know, toolkit sense of it. But in terms of rhythm and pitch and kind of you know, they were all big takes, long performed takes. Um I just think it's important that we don't lose the ability to, to listen kind of imaginatively rather than like just listening on the surface. Mm. You know, because listening on the surface basically like the lowest common denominator. Is it in time? Is it in tune? Is it a good song? Do I like the melody? Do I want to dance? Do I want to, you know, do I want, does it make me do what I think it, I want to do? But like, that's quite difficult as going back to the beginning of this, like how do you develop a relationship with something that doesn't change or, or how do you develop a relationship with something that is kind of mechanically perfect? How do you develop a relationship? How, why do you listen to that again and again and again and again? Like what is there to listen to again and again and again? You know, it's the, the kind of the human condition that's missing. It's like the, the flaws, the the imperfections that lead to the curiosity that keep a relationship going. It's not the perceived perfection of things, you know. I think it's really, really unproubling seeing all of the music now and kind of pop stuff, which I love. I absolutely love my, I love my kind of tween pop hits. But um, I do think it's, it does. It does make it difficult to listen to things that aren't ironed out. Mm. You know, if, if that's all you're used to, something that isn't that sounds less good. Like it sounds less. Yeah. Something. I don't know. It's, and I say I that as a as a professional in this industry. Yeah. You know, the more I listen to the kind of process stuff, I'm like, yeah, it's great. Mm. It it does exactly what it says. It, I know exactly what I'm meant to feel. It's like, this is a happy song. I'm happy. This is a sad song. I'm sad. Then then what do you do if something isn't spoon-fed? Like, oh, oh, how do I listen to this? How do I feel about that? Um, I don't know. This is this is all kind of a bit well, maybe concept we're, Maybe but we're lucky we have the old stuff still, you know, so you can still listen yeah. to... The Beatles or the Rolling Stones or Michael Jackson, and it's yeah. and it's all 
as you know as close to perfect as they got when you put it under today's standards there's a lot yeah. off so it's not like we can we only hear what's out today and then we lose sight of it i guess we still have that to yeah. fall back on but, it but is where do you go from there i think it's i think that's the thing it's like i sort of worry <laughs> that you know the the like amount of stuff is, yeah it's like the, the constant striving <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's like oh it's done yeah you know i don't know i don't know so this this is all the kind of stuff that like feeds into or has fed into the sort of my thought process i guess over the last couple of years or the last mm. five ten years of leading into these records of you know trying to trying to trying to exercise the demons of these these thoughts like, like you know it's not saying this is the one true way of doing it or this is the answer but it's i think it's an interesting it's an interesting space it's an interesting time so i think to be producing music and um and also amazing like how how different the output can be excuse me but using the same instruments you know in, in my case i guess it's like on patina half of it being kind of modern or you know relatively modern technology whether it's you know synthesizers or vocoders drum machines um with really old things like cellos violins pianos harmoniums um how can you create something new out of some completely old it's like i i think it's an interesting challenge and it's an interesting um yeah the, the kind of the, con the overriding concept stuff is definitely the the bit that keeps me mm. interested in going in it so like, how do you make something really like this all and tactile like how do you how, like going to an art gallery and like seeing an oil painting you know you want to touch it that's what i want from music mm. don't want, i don't want to go and look at photographs on a screen i want to go and see the oil painting like that's what i want it's yeah. that kind of depth of feel see and, the shadows on the texture yeah you know and the texture of the oil the, the, the exactly and then the, the different brush that they use or a different palette knife their thumb like how they put the paint on the canvas makes a difference mm. And it makes a difference how we play these instruments. It's just, it's not always conveyed very well through the recording medium. And I think that's where I keep coming back to. It's like, I want to be able to t touch the sound of this. Like, it's got to feel like it's happening there. Right. You know, um, yeah, that's, that's my kind of thing okay <laughs> <laughs> have you seen any the videos on youtube where they will like quantize you know like john bonham of led zeppelin or they'll auto tune um you know michael jackson or some no. there's some cool th the one person that's done a few is dr bob music surgery i'll put links in the show notes um he's, Please, he's great do. i love his channel but um he's he quantized um uh van halen <sighs> <laughs> and, oh my god and especially like um i think it might have been like running with the devil maybe like early wow. like kind of off the rails david lee roth van halen <laughs> where they're part of what's fun about them is they're just like nuts and it's amazing um what it does to the music and or when you quantize certain singers that where all their emotion is in how they reach the note and how they yeah. kind of fall off the note when they're done singing the word and today so much music is by default on the grid maybe auto-tuned where it doesn't even get the chance to you don't get to feel it and yeah. usually almost every time the untouched uncorrected music is just you just feel it so much more it's got that life yeah. and it's not where it's supposed to be but it is where it's supposed to be because of that because the band got yeah, psyched when they got to the chorus and the, and the energy it. rose I feel like what you, it's got to be striving for that. It's not where it's meant to be, but it's where it had to be. You know, yeah. That's the that's the thing. 
um, yeah, it's a tough, tough one because then you also think like, oh, you've got to listen back to this conceivably for the rest of time, mm. <laughs> you know, and um, but just leaving something that's out of tune on the top playlist. I think, yeah. am I going to do that? It's but tough. actually, I think you've got, you know, it's easier to. So easy. And it's easy to hear, you know, like Neil Young kind of like reach for the note and fade off of it in his artful way of doing it. But to hear yourself doing it, you hear it as a yes. mistake. You know, you hear yeah. Neil Young, you're like, no, that's how it had to be. That's it's beautiful. That's how it had. Yeah, exactly. But it's so hard to hear that in yourself <laughs> sometimes because you're being critical of your performance to begin with because you need to be in order to get a good one. Yet you also have to uh, recognize when something wrong is right in that kind of mindset. Totally true. Totally true. I think that's where you're trusting an engineer or, or a producer or something. That's where that kind of trust is so valuable. Hmm. Um, but it's difficult, really yeah. difficult to establish it or find it or know that you're looking for it. You know, um, yeah, it's, I don't know. I'd say it's, it's just it's so easy, so easy to do all of these fixes. It's really difficult to not to have the confidence to not do it. Yeah. Really difficult. Um, well, when I open a session, it's already got the grid going, the metronome's there, just click it, and yeah, you know, it, it does make me play tighter keeps me and it's easier to play along yeah. with myself when I know where myself yeah. is going to be. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good challenge. It's a good challenge. I think, but I think kind of aesthetically it's, it's going to be an interesting thing for the next little while to see how this all plays out. And, and also like a large part of it will be taste like, the aesthetic that is now fairly well established. Like, how do you, how does that evolve? Mm. <laughs> Quite lately. And, um, you know, how does that evolve? And how do we, you know, do we? I mean, or is the sound that we're reaching for now? Like, I saw, I actually went to someone's house recently, and honestly, it, it looked like, an Instagram post. It's like, wow, it's gone from being the one little moment of perfection to people like actually living that life. You're like, Gee, Don't sit on the couch. Scary. That's for yeah, exactly. display purposes it's not only. Real. <laughs> it's it's actually made of cardboard. You know. Um, but I'm sort of fascinated by that as well. Like hmm. you know, the point that the perception becomes reality. You know, the, the point that, so, well, actually, in some respects, what's happened in the recording age and the kind of performance world, you know, players did get a lot better. Like, you listen to old, old recordings of, like, I'm talking about like really seriously old recordings of, of cellists, because that's what I, that's my thing. Um, and the technical level has just increased, like, exponentially since the, 1900s you know the base level of you know students is sort of higher than mm. top world class performers just the technical like mechanically technical level and yet you listen to these old recordings you're like yeah there's still there's something there there's like there's mm. a real kind of storytelling or whatever there's real kind of communication um, but it's interesting like through all of this recording stuff recorded um, music like self-awareness and, and critical listening are at an all-time high so I feel like the standards have raised so high you know maybe people just play because everything is expected to be mechanically in time maybe people will start playing mechanically in time and will lose that kind of fluidity of 
of tempo, maybe it will become something that's not actually like a useful or attractive part of the sort of expressive toolkit. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I think so much of it is, is led by the kind of collective aesthetic that we all kind of inhabit, it's like what you acknowledge to be an acceptable sound. You know, you go to a, you listen to Baroque music or Renaissance music played at Renaissance or Baroque pitch, it sounds wrong to a modern ear because it's different, like the mm. intonation is different. So maybe it'll just be like that. Maybe we're just sort of evolving into a place where expressive intonation or expressive timing just sounds wrong. Mm. You know, maybe we're entering an age where that stuff isn't isn't palatable. I don't know. I don't know. Mm. I'm, I'm just a fan. Thirty years from now, just, we'll I'm, hear the yeah. Beatles and be like, "These guys really sucked." <laughs> they really couldn't play in time. <laughs> wow. No, but it, I don't know. It's something I'm just really fascinated by. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if there's an answer. It's just a kind of a question I like to ask. Well, when ask I myself. first moved into using a computer to record. I was really excited because a lot of my problems were solved of like keeping time, especially. And sure. I could take drum samples and put them right on the grid and like build yeah. the beat that way. And I immediately noticed like something was wrong, you know? Um, whereas I've always been fighting against the, you know, whether it's the sound quality or the performance, always wanted it to be better, better, better. And then when it finally got to that point of the computer and putting things there, I started doing that. I was like, ah, oh, like, I don't know. I, I, I guess I started to recognize like it's, it's not better perfect. Like there's some happy medium that I need to find between yeah. what I can actually do and what the computer can yeah. do. And uh, it did give me an appreciation because I used to think, you know, if the band slowed down at all, that was that was a problem. We can't we can't slow. We can't speed up. We have to be solid. We got to be on key. We got to be in pitch. We got to be in tune. And here I am now, where I have virtual synths. Where if you put the tuner on after the virtual synth, that green light, like that guitar pedal style tuner, is on zero point zero cents from the intended note, and you can never get your guitar to do that. You can't yeah. play a string and have it. It'll start a little sharp, and then it kind of wobbles yeah. around. You always try to just get in the neighborhood of the pitch. But um, I found that when I start putting together all these instruments that are all hitting that perfect tune, and there's no, they almost like just stick together, and mm -hmm. there's no life. There's no none of that kind of like. I don't know the word, but they don't like kind of like swim with each other in the mix yeah. it gets yeah. lost so yeah, it's well, giving me an appreciation for that i don't know maybe maybe we'll look back and be you know in these last 20 30 years of music and just be like i can't even listen to that perfect music <laughs> yeah. i don't know <laughs> yeah it's interesting no i think it's, it's an interesting but i think more than anything else it's just important to be asking those questions and listening with that and think well this is something that I value or you value or you, you want to explore more of. And I think that's the important thing rather than assuming that something has to be on the grid or in the key, you know, in, in the kind of melodyne or auto-tune kind of slug, slug world. Right. Um, I think it's just important that it's kind of okay to, to question it rather than have to slam something to a good for it to be palatable but i don't know as i say maybe maybe this is like crazy old-fashioned thinking and actually i just need to get with the time i don't know it's, it's something i spend a lot of time thinking about <laughs> yeah. i had a guitar teacher a great guitar teacher and um we'd bring him our songs if we wanted to learn something and he'd put it on the tape and he'd figure it out right in front of our face like magic and we, I gave him a Soundgarden song once. Uh, I, I don't remember the, which song it is, but I remember the guitar goes like, dun, 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 like in the intro. And in between one of those, dun, 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 there's kind of like a little amplifier, like, like just a noise. Okay. And he kept playing it back. He's like, you hear that? 
It's like, that's a mistake, but they kept it because it sounds like they're pumped. It sounds like they're psyched. And he's like, today they'd edit that out. You know, and um, I, I, that stuck with me a lot that like some of those little things that happen are where the energy of the song comes from, where the life, where yeah. the kind of like, you, know, you capture in a moment in time and sometimes something happens that brings that moment to life and it makes it special. I have yeah. a song where I, it's like a rock song and then it goes into like a little classical guitar part. Yeah, so it gets quiet and I'm recording it. My yeah. cat goes between my legs because cats love to get involved. And he made a little jingle and I very nearly redid the take because it's not supposed to be there and it's quiet, so you really hear it. But I left it. And now when I hear that recording, you know, I, there's my cat. And I remember exactly where I was sitting. And, you know, I remember what it used to feel like when my cat was still alive and do things like that. It, and, um, you know, for all the tracks that I recorded on that album, like I remember where I was sitting exactly for that one. I remember that moment perfectly. It's just the life. The life. Wow. See, that, that's the stuff. That's, yeah, that's it. And that's, that I think, because that's, you know, the, the, the Tina, that's, that's what it sort of is. It's, the, it's like the, the impact of uh, physical life. So like, you know, a leather jacket that's brand new, pristine, has no <laughs> life to it. But you see the kind of 30 year old leather jackets all like gnarly and yeah, it's awesome. know, super comfortable to the person <laughs> who wears it. And that's it's the patina of the leather has molded to their life. And I just I just love that. I just, that's is that the, is that the word patina? That. Is that what that means? Mm. Yeah. I, I didn't I don't know that word. Yeah. So, that, that's that was the thing it's the impact of yeah like the texture and impact of them um, because hmm. yeah. your body has like you said with the genes too like it takes your body yeah. adjusting and squirming and moving into yeah. a thing or like then... when I, I keep my wallet in my front right pocket like there's a <laughs> kind of outline. outline of where that is yeah yeah, yeah right it'd be different for everyone else everyone's wallet is different everyone's yeah, whatever, pockets are different whatever you carry and that, yeah, I just I find that really kind of intoxicating. I find it really mm. amazing. Yeah, it takes life and it takes time. Kind of, yeah, living in it. Yeah, mm. yeah. and it's that oh, relationship. Cool that? I think it's difficult. Yeah, and I feel like it's it's difficult to kind of foster those like relationships. Hmm build that into the music and preserve it or cat walking between your legs or whatever it is like, that's the stuff that is interesting and kind of textural and like they're good stories you know mm. and that, that's what we i think latch on to you know yeah. I, think it's, um, I don't know but that's that's my kind of interest in this thing well, that does give you that kind of um, replay value, I guess. That you were kind of mm. mentioning, like, if it's perfect, like, you know, all right, well, there it is. It did what it's supposed to do, and it yeah. almost doesn't surprise you. But when there's something yeah. where you can play back your favorite songs and be like, what was that? What's that little thing going on yeah. there, you know? <laughs> and yeah. it, like, it leaves never something to the imagination. Before. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, it's like any other relationship, you know, if it's, the same forever or, or you feel like it's the same forever and it, it doesn't have any anywhere to go and you know there's no mm. you know you need, you need um yeah it's the imperfections in in things that, that give it kind of life and meaning and context and, and stuff and that's that's what i wanted to explore in, in that record mm. yeah that's definitely part of what drew me to it you know and hearing it that cool. that was a consideration and it comes through you know in the sounds and just the way the instruments are recorded and probably the takes you decided to use and the ones you decided to leave behind mm -hmm. i find that kind of approach liberating myself because i don't really mind you know I, we were talking before i think we started i'm i'm in the basement you know of my yeah. house and, and i like that 
it's not a fancy soundproof you know, I've done my best but it's not you know I'd feel guilty like charging anyone studio time or anything you know what I'm saying <laughs> so um once in a while my dogs bark and they get in on a recording and, and once in a while something happens somebody's talking in the background or I've done recordings where like even like the tv is like humming low in the background and it just brings it to life and you know i you could never you could never do that because you weren't here where you know say like uh somebody was having a conversation in the background i recorded a bunch yeah. of piano samples with my mom and my grandma and my aunt all talking in the background and put them in the sampler and when you play it um you hear those voices kind of looping and swirling and you don't really know what they're saying oh, yeah. but it you hear life and yeah in that situation i had an ipad it was like one of the early ipads that's what i recorded it on so it was like you know very um far from ideal but i i i love the results so much more that i wasn't like hey everybody we need to get serious and quiet because i'm about to start sampling this and i'm really <laughs> important <laughs> you know <laughs> but having all that kind of like noise like yeah, you know, when you play that instrument now, like you hear things, and you're like, "What is that? That's yeah. fun." That's it, it, it. You start filling in the story in your imagination. Yeah, definitely. And I think you know, even not knowing the story, you, as a kind of third person, you kind of latch on that, that there is one. There is something mm -hmm. further going on rather than just the surface of what you can hear. And I think it's all. Yeah, and that's that. That's the kind of the texture of life, isn't it? And that's the that's the interesting stuff. It allows you to be a participant too, instead of just a consumer, because you kind of fill it in. You you imagine things. What is that? I don't know. Yeah. Makes me think of this, and you bring your whole life experience to that <laughs> interpretation. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It's a weird well, world, right? The, the recorded sound. Such yeah, a, strange, strange times. And so much music being released every day. Yeah. Constant, constant, constant barbarian. Uh, barb, what's the word? Constant, it, is, it is a barbarian. Bombardment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bombardment, that's the word. That's what I'm looking but for. But it's, it's so much that it's almost, I don't even know where to start sometimes that I don't, you know, I don't even know where to look yeah. for music because there's so much of it. <laughs> yeah. But it is. Yeah it's a blessing too when you can find those weird things that you never would have got well that's it yeah. that you never found in a record store or hmm. whatever yeah no it's yeah strange times <laughs> hmm. that's cool so you i know you have some cool things um in the future plan too um is there anything do you care to share to whet people's appetite for, you know, after they check out Patina and they want to know what's yeah. next or do you want to so I have a new record coming out uh, near the end of the year, um, which is a bit more of this kind of intense string sound stuff. But um, the end of this week, actually, I've, I've got a, a little EP coming out of uh, some reworks of tracks from my catalogue of uh, little piano pieces written for, you know, a couple of things from some films and some, some pieces from other albums, which I thought would be nice to kind of shine a new light on and and, uh, and give a little piano love to. Um, I'm not a very good pianist, but I think it's a great uh, medium to, you've got to really kind of boil it down to the... Mm bare bones you know you've got to really kind of it's a very elegant way of you've got to show a few things you've got 10 fingers like you've got a map from them of 10 elements that you can you can use um and it's yeah i think it's so that's coming out on friday um which i'm really looking forward to so. nice what's that called uh it's called piano book piano work yeah, piano book. Piano book, okay. Piano book. Yeah. So the idea is nice. to do more of this sort of stuff. You know, it's a, yeah, I find it really refreshing you know, revisiting old pieces with with different constraints. Yeah. You know, so rather than 
like, oh, I'm writing some string quartets. It's like, well, how would you present this on the piano? How would you present this? Or how would you present this piano work on the cello or on the synthesizer or whatever? You know, I think it's, you know, with a bit of distance from writing the original, it's a really, yeah, I find it very refreshing and very yeah, inspiring is the wrong word, but I do find it a really interesting process. Yeah. Um, Let's say yeah, so kind of the ultimate test for a song or a piece of music, if you can. Yeah. Can it, the can piano it be or acoustic guitar test. <laughs> yeah. Paired right down. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, so, you know, got those coming up and um, a couple of commissioned works. So some new, new pieces I've got to finish writing and, um, and a film I'm doing at the moment. So yeah, no, it's quite a busy, quite a busy time at the moment. Mm. But yeah, we'll get there. Nice. Hey, you know, <laughs> one step at a time. But I love yeah, what you're doing. I, I love this whole just ethos too. I mean, most of the music I'm into these days embraces that on some level um i i do um you know i i like paying attention to like production and music so um when things are kind of sometimes lacking life whether it's because they're too slick or on you know mm -hmm. it it um it doesn't affect me as much so what you're doing though is really tuned into that and i appreciate it and enjoy it very much oh great Oh, thanks very much. So we could tell people, I suppose, um, to head to Peter Gregson. It would be dot co dot uk. That's right? right. Yes. And um, there's also some cool stuff on YouTube that they can see, um, and you know, plenty of music to sort through. Really, um, I'll put a bunch of that in the show notes. And um, I think right. probably by the time we put this out in a couple of days or so, that new piano book release might be out. So yeah. I think people can just go look it up at this point, but it'll also right. be in the show notes. Cool. Get into your world yeah. a little bit. Nice one. Well, it's been such yeah. a great, uh, great pleasure to chat. And yeah, enjoyed it very many, much. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, so many sort of weird and wonderful paths through. Yeah, that, that's how I like it. <laughs> yeah. That's no, great. <laughs> and thank you to you, the listener. We hope you have a yeah, great thanks day. Thanks so much.